continuing on with our papyri, we want to now look briefly at the famous Martin Bodmer, Bodmer papyri, P66 and P75. These were purchased by Martin Bodmer of Geneva, and they were housed in uh, a, a little uh, two-building museum, a gorgeous museum, up in the village of Colony on the, the shores of Lake Geneva. It's not part of the city of Geneva, but it's its own little village um, on the shore. And uh, it was published by, uh, 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 published by uh, uh, Martin Bodmer's uh, associates in the 1950s and 1960s, P66 first, P75 a little bit later. P66 has most of John's Gospel through the four, four, first 14 chapters. It's virtually complete. Then after that, you've got fragments. And it's dated about A.D. 175. Some dated as early as 150, some as late as 200, maybe even into the early 3rd century. A good average dating is right around 175. P75 has most of Luke and most of John, and it's dated at about A.D. 200 plus, maybe a little bit later than that. So it's not quite as early as P66, but what we'll see is that it's a significantly better manuscript than P66. P66 is not a bad manuscript at all. It's a very good manuscript. It's just that P75 is a phenomenal manuscript. And so we'll be looking at this in terms of the text. P52 was important because of how early it is and how it shows that John's gospel existed uh, before the second half of the second century. P66 and P75 are going to show us the actual text of John and of Luke and how uh, our, our favored manuscripts from the 4th century really accurately reflect that early text. Now, P66 did not or does not contain the pericope adulteri. That's Latin for the story of the adulteress, the story of the woman caught in adultery, John 7.53 through 8.11. That's one of the two large passages in the New Testament that is more than two verses long that's disputed as to its authenticity. Uh, this is one of the most beloved passages of Scripture, and uh, I would call it my favorite passage that's not in the Bible. Uh, it's uh, one of these where we, we all have a lot of emotional baggage uh, associated with it. We want it to be part of the Bible. I've heard pastors, even some well-known pastors preach on this passage and uh, at my church a, a pastor did this at one time and so I, I emailed them later and I said you know that passage is almost surely not authentic he said oh but it, it's so rich I, I just want it to be authentic I said I'd love for that to be the case too but we have to base our faith on evidence it can't be something that's contrary to the evidence and he said well I just pray that one of these days we'll find an early manuscript of the story of the woman caught in adultery. The earliest manuscript we have of this passage is from the fifth century. And uh, through the first eight centuries, the vast majority of manuscripts didn't have it at all. Then starting in the ninth, it becomes uh, the majority reading. It's not found in most lectionaries. Uh, we don't have a church father quoting on the passage, uh, commenting on it until the 12th century. It doesn't fit into John's vocabulary, it doesn't fit into his style, it disrupts the flow of the narrative. There's all sorts of reasons why it's not authentic, as much as we all would like it to be. And the scribes also wanted it to be. In fact, they wanted it to be so much that they weren't sure where it went, but they were just sure this is a true story about Jesus. So it goes here after John 7.52. It goes in two other places in John 7. It goes at the end of the fourth gospel, just as a standalone story. It goes between Luke and John, and it goes after Luke 21.38. It's a, it's a floating text. When a text floats, that normally tells you something's fishy about it, and it often can mean it's uh, probably not authentic. When we look at the text of the New Testament, even the most cherished passages we have to subject to rigorous historical inquiry. And if you had never heard of this passage before, if you'd never read it in your life, I don't think your faith would be diminished. Do we see Jesus forgiving sinners elsewhere? Of course we do. So here's, here's a text that as much as we would like it to be the case, it almost surely is not what John wrote. But that's actually a different issue than the question, okay, if he didn't write it, did it happen historically? So one question is, is it canonical? The other question is, is it historical? 
And one of my last lectures will devote our, our attention just to this passage and talk about uh, whether it's canonical, whether it's historical. And uh, in fact, while I'm giving the, this lecture uh, uh, or the lectures uh, at uh, Credo House, there is an article that is on its way to being published written by one of my students. It was actually a paper he did in the master's program at Dallas Seminary, and it's going to get published in uh, Novum Testamentum, one of the great journals of the New Testament in the world published out of Holland. And I think he has come probably to the solution as to where this passage came from. And uh, I'll be talking about that when I lecture on it. But P66 didn't have this. Uh, not only does P66 not have it, but Codex Sinaiticus doesn't have it. Codex Vaticanus doesn't have it. Codex Alexandrinus, which is a Byzantine manuscript in the Gospels, doesn't have it. And the story of the woman caught in adultery is a Byzantine reading. Uh, so we'll, we'll wrestle with those issues. But this is an early and a very important manuscript of John. I'll look at one other reading or two other readings here with you in just a minute. But the scribe was more concerned with calligraphy than the text. This was a professionally trained scribe. And you can see this by looking at the text. Notice how uniform the letters are in terms of the size. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a handsome manuscript, uh, well written. The scribe really was concerned with making pretty letters, if you will. And what's interesting about this is what he calls the Gospel of John. Read along with me, if you would, at the top it says, Euangelion kata Ioane, the Gospel according to John. Now, we're going to come back to this issue later when we look at the major majuscules, but all I want to note for you right now is this. It doesn't call it according to John. It calls it the Gospel according to John. And we're going to wrestle with that issue when we think about the major manuscripts, but just keep that in the back of your mind as uh, uh, we get to that point. Here is this manuscript. Late second century is the date, and it has the gospel according to John. Now, the other famous Bodmer papyrus is P75. Uh, it also does not have the story of the woman caught in adultery. It also is an early and very important manuscript of Luke and John. And uh, in fact... Next to the Vatican, uh, next to Codex Vaticanus, that is, this is the most important manuscript we have for Luke and John. Uh, I would consider it to be probably the third most important New Testament manuscript in the world because of how carefully done it was. The scribe was not a professional, probably did this for personal use, uh, but he was a faithful scribe. And uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's early. It's a very important manuscript of Luke and John. And it agrees with Codex Vaticanus more than any other early manuscript. These two manuscripts have the closest agreement of any two early manuscripts. It's very significant when we begin to think about that. The scribe copied one letter at a time, did a faithful copy, very faithful, strict, rigorous controls, a private copy. And this manuscript was a gift to the Vatican in 2006. Now, this is one of these curious twists on this whole thing. When I visited the Bodmer Museum in 2003, it was being renovated. It had been under renovation for some time. And uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, they decided to sell their most precious item in the entire museum, P75. I wanted to go to the Bodmer Museum primarily to see P75, but secondarily to see P66, the second most important item in the Bodmer Museum. Maybe they ran out of money. I just don't know. But they sold this manuscript so that they could renovate the museum further. That seems kind of strange. It's like you've got a Ferrari in your garage, and you want to make your garage bigger to show it off, then you sell the Ferrari so you can pay for the garage. You know, just not a, not, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I do know this, that in 2006, when they offered it to the world for sale, Yale University offered them $50 million for this manuscript. They were turned down. The Vatican got it. It was donated to the Vatican by an anonymous donor who purchased it at an undisclosed price, presumably more than $50 million. You can make a pretty nice museum that then has a big hole in a very important part, but... That's P75. Well, let's take a look at the text. This is Luke chapter 24, 
in John chapter 1 in 375. What they typically did on these manuscripts is when they got to the end of the book, they'd also repeat the name of it. So it says in chicken scratch Greek, the gospel according to Luke, uh, this kind of narrowing column at the, bo- uh, at the top of the first section, and then the beginning of the next section, the gospel according to John. This is the oldest manuscript with the end of one gospel and the beginning of another on the same page. It's remarkable to have this on both pages. What this tells us is we know that in our early manuscripts, the order of the gospels was Luke and then John, rather than John and then Luke. Uh, And uh, at the same time, we do know of other early manuscripts that the order was John and Luke. In the Western order, we have Matthew and then John, then Luke and Mark. Whole dissertations have been done on the order of books of the New Testament and why they were done in certain areas of things. It's just absolutely fascinating to think about. The order we know, though, is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Western order, which I'm going to argue may have been the original order of of the earliest manuscripts that uh, uh, were put together that had all four Gospels in them, may have been uh, in the Western order. But note the title. Again, just like in Codex uh, P66, it's the Gospel according to John. Now, you can't note the title, but... You know, it's, you've got Evangelion on the top line, then Kata Ioannin on the second line. Gospel, according to John. We're going to come back to this when we look at the major manuscripts, and you'll see that. But let's compare the text of P66 and the text of P75, and you'll see that we're dealing with something that's pretty ugly, or I should say pretty, and then ugly. Uh, P66 on the left, P75 on the right, You can see one uniform letter, beautiful handwriting. The second one, it's just, it's okay. But it's sure nothing to write home about, except for the quality of the text, which is magnificent. And what I would say is that this is the kind of proof that we have that professional scribes are not always the most faithful scribes. And so when Bart Ehrman argued with me in our second debate at uh, uh, SMU, that the earliest scribes were not professionally trained, therefore they made a lot of mistakes. Those two don't necessarily go together. P75 was not a professional scribe, and yet he's one of the more, most careful scribes we have of all of our New Testament manuscripts. There are 17 early papyri, in fact, that are not professionally done, but have a very, very good quality text. So uh, there's no direct correspondence between quality of a a scribe's professional training and the quality of his text. Those two things are hit and miss. Now, I want to talk about a a textual problem, one last textual problem. We've talked about the title, we've talked about the story of the woman caught in adultery, and then we're going to look at this one textual problem in John chapter 1, and then I'll summarize on all the papyri for us. In John chapter 1, verse 18, in the King James Bible, it says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. I should note this, that in the original King James, the word him at the end is put in italics. I'll talk about that in just a minute, but just keep that in mind. Then the Net Bible a modern translation that I was uh, the senior New Testament editor for, uh, says, No one has ever seen God. The only one, himself God, who is in closest fellowship with the Father, has made him known. Now, besides the modern translation, uh, and especially uh, the changing of only begotten to only one, it's the same Greek word, it's just that Uh, Translators today feel that that Greek word probably means the unique one rather than the only begotten one. The only other difference here, really, is in the Greek word after begotten or only one. Is it son or is it God? And those two words are what's at at, uh, debate here. The King James has the only begotten son. Do we see the only son, the monogenes uh, huios is what it is in Greek, in uh, John's gospel? You bet we do. We see it again in John 3.16. John uses this. It's, it's one of his favorite terms. Do we see monogenes theos, the unique one, himself God, anywhere else in John's gospel? Nowhere else in John's gospel does it occur. Nowhere else in the New Testament does it occur. So the question is, 
what is likely to have happened here? Did the scribes change son to God? When nowhere else in the New Testament do you have that expression. Or did they see God in the text and say, wait a minute, that's not what I'm used to, and change it to son? I take it that the second thing is exactly what happened. Now, when you actually look at the manuscripts, what's significant is that P66 and P75 and other early Alexandrian manuscripts, although these are our earliest ones for this passage, have the unique one, or the only one, himself God here. That suggests that that's what the original text says. Uh, now, I mentioned to you a little bit earlier about him in italics. The King James Bible follows, this is, this is not related to papyri, so it's free, it won't show up on the exam, but it's, it's just kind of fun stuff to know. It follows the tradition that was started with the Geneva Bible in 1560 of putting words in italics that were not in the original language. Uh, now, how do we use italics today? Same way? No, we use italics to say, this is emphasized. This is something that's really there, really strong there. It's emphatic in the original, something like that. There is one translation, modern translation, that still uses, or did up until very, very recently, italics to indicate it's absent in the original. That's the New American Standard Bible. Uh, I'm, I'm perplexed by this. Uh, I, I have great respect for the New American Standard Bible, but there's two things that it does that are related to the fact that it's supposed to be a revision of the King James, just like the Revised Bible was, the Revised Standard Bible, the American Standard. All these are meant to be in the, the stream of tradition of the King James. One of them is it puts words in italics that in our modern lingo probably should be put in brackets instead. And the other thing is it begins, each verse starts its own new paragraph. It indents it. Now, later editions of the New American Standard now allow it to be done the other way, but uh, what you, the older versions especially would have every verse would be indented, and a new paragraph would be bold and indented. That's how you knew it was a new paragraph. But what does that encourage? It encourages people not to read a verse in its context, not to read it in its paragraph, and a proof text to grab one verse, you know, uh, Judas went out and hanged himself, and then you read another verse, go and therefore and do likewise. You know, it's, it's just, that's not going to be a helpful way to read the scriptures. But the, the fact is, we need to read these things in their paragraphs, in their context. Why does it do it that way? Because in 1551, uh, Robert Estian, or Stephanus, produced a Greek New Testament. Uh, it's called the fourth edition of his New Testament, 1551. It's the first New Testament ever that had verse numbers in it. And what he did was he had a Greek text, the Greek text of Erasmus, the Latin Vulgate, and then Erasmus's Latin translation. In order for people to see where these verses lined up, he actually gave them numbers for the first time. The chapters had already been done by a, a, a scholar several centuries before, but now Stephen Langton was the one. He was actually uh, the Archbishop of, of Canterbury. And uh, so Robert Estian or Stephanus is putting these verse numbers in so you could see where they are in the text. But when he did, he starts each new verse indenting it like it's its own paragraph. The first translation that used verse numbers was the Geneva Bible, 1560, indenting each verse so it's a brand new paragraph. The King James did that as well. The very form of the Word of God has influenced how people read it. If we read this as emphatic because it's in italics, we're saying something that is much stronger than what the original text says. If we're reading these verses in isolation rather than within their own paragraph, we're wrenching them from their context and making claims that perhaps we need to back off on at times. So the form of the Word of God has influenced how it's been interpreted. So that was all for free, but here's the basic point to stress here. I take it that these early papyri represent the original wording of John 1.18. And they are saying, himself God, it's the word theos, it's, a, it's just uh, basically if these two words would have been in their nominous sac or their abbreviated forms, it would be a single letter difference. But the word huios was not uh, used as a nomen sacrum early on, it came centuries later. So. Uh, more, like, more than likely, someone changed the word Thaos, the word God, to the word Son, because that's what he was used to, and consequently, 
the King James Version doesn't affirm the deity of Christ quite as strongly as modern translations do in this verse. They claim, oh, you modern translations, you stripped out the deity of Christ. Well, no, the modern translations are simply trying to be faithful to the text. Here's a place where it affirms it. There's two other places where modern translations affirm the deity of Christ where the King James does not, not on the basis of textual evidence, but on the basis of, of Greek grammar. So we're just trying to be honest with the text, which, by the way, very clearly affirms the deity of Christ. Okay, let me summarize then on the papyri. Papyri are extraordinarily important for the text of the New Testament. We have half of the New Testament in them. These early papyri especially tell us what the shape of that text looked like in, at that time in history. And compared to the fuller later manuscripts, they confirm the text of the better manuscripts. That is, our great majuscules of the 4th century, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, which most scholars would regard as the two most important New Testament manuscripts uh, even uh, that, that we have of all time that, that exist still today. Those manuscripts, their readings are confirmed by what these papyri say. And let me just conclude with this one, one point. Hort of the Westcott-Hort duo found in a number of places in Luke and John where he felt the, co the, the text of Codex Vaticanus had the original wording and no other manuscripts did. When P75 was discovered and published in 1961, scholars began to realize P75 also has that same wording that Codex Vaticanus did in several of those places, most of those, confirming that the way Hort was doing textual criticism was absolutely valid and that uh, uh, what he discovered was, was uh, right on target. All right, thank you. Hello, this is Tim. I'm the executive director of the Credo House, and I hope that you've been enjoying and loving these Credo courses. Just want to take a quick second uh, that what you see, what's happening in the background there, that is not a production studio that we made just for the Credo courses, but that is called the Inklings Room. The Inklings Room is just one of the three rooms at the Credo House. Right now, I'm in the big room uh, where you can hear a latte machine going on behind me, music happening in here. Uh, we typically get several hundred people every week coming in our doors where we are what we think is one of the most unique evangelistic places that exists where we just want to be on the front lines of the intellectual persecution of the church today and so we invite you that if you're ever in Edmond Oklahoma to come and get a latte from the Credo House hang out here but then go into the Inklings room where we film the Credo courses uh, it's a great room we can tell you about the history of the Inklings tell you about that room and then our other super secret map room as well but you can and learn about that at credohouse.org, or we invite you to come and hang out with us over a Luther latte at the Credo House.